It's now time for question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you for your your words as well. Very emotional words. Your uh, my question is for the Premier. Your budget is being presented today for the final vote. In the pre-budget hearings held throughout Ontario, we heard from all walks of life. People said, do something to help families struggling to pay their hydro bills. Businesses told you, get out of our way so we can create jobs and restore the Ontario that you've ruined. But you did neither. Instead, you dug deeper into the pockets of families and seniors, and you put forward a bill that makes it even more expensive to do business in Ontario. Premier, why do you continue to refuse to listen to the people of Question. Ontario? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, the member opposite was excited when the announcement of the Northern Industrial Energy Rate uh, program was announced as being permanent, Mr. Speaker. I know that he understands that that is uh, a real boon to industry in the North. I know that he, uh, when constituents come to him, he talks to them about the programs that, uh, that uh, are in place in order to mitigate the cost of hydro, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure that he lets see and people in low income know that there are programs in place to support them, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure he lets them know about that. He also knows that some of those, like making the Northern Industrial Energy uh, Rate uh, Program permanent, that was part of our budget, Mr. Speaker. So I say to the member opposite, there was much in our budget, whether yes, it's the investments in infrastructure, so the roads and bridges and communities in his, in his area and around his community, or whether it was the increase in the minimum Thank wage, you. Mr. Speaker that will help people in this problem. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, it's clear what's actually happened to Ontario under your term. We now have the highest hydro rates in North America. They went up 15 per cent last month alone, and with your fire sale of Hydro Run, one, they're going to rise even higher. Premier, we have the highest payroll taxes in Canada, and with your pension tax, they are poised to rise even higher. That's why GM, Ford, Chrysler, dozens of industries, our largest retailers, banded together with 50 chambers of commerce to say you're wrong. We had 2,700 fewer businesses in Ontario last year than the year before. They're not out of business, Premier. They're out of Ontario. All the experts have told you to change course, Question. Premier. Why do you continue to ignore them? Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, there, there are a range of issues that the, uh, the member opposite has raised, but let me just, let me just uh, say to him that it is very important to us to recognize that Ontario, once again this year, is the number one jurisdiction for direct foreign investment, Mr. Speaker, in North America. That is, that is a very important no. fact for us. You know, the conditions that are in place in Ontario uh, are drawing business and drawing industry to the province, Mr. Speaker. The other issues that he has raised in terms of the need for uh, an enhancement to the pension plan, Mr. Speaker, and our response to the federal government that is not interested in uh, enhancing the Canada pension plan, we are putting forward an Ontario retirement pension plan. Mr. Speaker, that's to solve a problem. The problem is that Answer. people cannot save enough, and what the business owners have said is be Member careful with the design. We are listening to them. We are listening to the business owners across the province. The Associate Thank Minister you. of Finance is talking to people across the province. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Premier. As usual, you say one thing, but the complete opposite is true. Your pension tax will hurt businesses and families. Your Hydro One fire sale will drive up hydro rates and hurt families and seniors. The officers of the legislature of will lose oversight, and your hydro deal will be done in complete secrecy. All this is so that you can continue your infrastructure charade. 
you say Minister, you need the money to transit, but it was already in last year's budget without the money from the pension tax and the hydro fire sale. It's all a ruse. It's all a shell game. You are so desperate for cash, and everybody in this building knows it. Premier, will you Minister stand down your final time. budget vote today and take Question. a long, hard second look at the damage it's going to cause Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. You know, I think the, the people of Nipissing uh, alone, but I think many people across the province would be interested to know that the member opposite and his party think that the Canada Pension Plan is a tax. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, because that's the extension of what he is saying. He is saying that an enhancement to the Canada Pension Plan, the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan that we would put in place is a tax. That's not what pensions are, Mr. Speaker. Pensions are about putting an investment. Stop the clock. Please finish. The, the young people, the 20 and 30 and 40 year olds in Nipissing and in Renfrew and across this province, Mr. Speaker, are not able to save enough, even when they have jobs, Mr. Speaker. The fact is. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, second time. Pension, Mr. Speaker, is not a tax. We are listening to the businesses and individuals around the province Answer. on the design. In terms of the uh, the hydro one, Mr. Speaker, we are building transit. We are building transportation infrastructure. It was in our budget that one Answer, of the ways we were you. going to pay for that was through. Thank you. New question: The member for Menfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy. Former Premier Dalton McGuinty once said this about privatizing Hydro One. Selling off a natural public monopoly is a bad idea. It's a quick fix, and it's a bad one. They are, pre they are prepared to sell off our one and only electricity highway. Perhaps he should have ended by saying, unless it's the Liberals and they're desperate for cash. <laughs> Former Liberal Cabinet Minister and Energy critic Sean Conway said this about the sale of Hydro One. It is unacceptable that there is no public the oversight Carlton. or accountability. But perhaps he should have clarified this with, unless hiding things saves the Liberals from future scandals. <laughs> Minister, is it not true that you're rushing headlong with the fire sale of Hydro One because you've maxed out the provincial credit cards yeah. and you want to avoid any scrutiny from the Hydro One scandals to come? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member for Whit Whitby, Oshawa, said on March 5, 2015, as Premier, I will order an immediate review of all assets owned by government. Every dollar made will be invested in new infrastructure right across our province. Let's use member the full value of these assets to build time. the roads, highways, member from Leeds Granville. roads, highways, subways, and infrastructure that every Ontarian can use, Mr. Speaker. And let's hear about Patrick Brown when asked about asset modernization. I generally believe that the private sector can do a better job than the public sector. I generally think market conditions would be helpful for a lot of government agencies. Mr. Speaker, in the supplementary, I'll speak to their white policy paper. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you. Back to the minister. Minister, we all know that you want the Ombudsman report into Hydro One scandalous billing practices to just go away. Poof. However, customers of the utility will will not soon forget the anxiety and distress that you caused them when the amounts of incorrect bills were automatically withdrawn from their bank accounts and customer service agents at Hydro One treated them like they were the thieves when they tried to get the errors corrected. Yet no one at Hydro One has been fired even though customers were often treated with disdain and managers tried to obfuscate the Ombudsman's investigation. Minister, is it not time that openness and accountability be restored? And those who were in charge during this billing fiasco be terminated.
Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I think that's a wake-up call to the truth. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the legislation, the legislation requires the new Hydro One to set up an office of an ombudsperson. Mr. Speaker, we've retained the former Auditor General of Canada, Denny Dozotel, to oversee the implementation of an ombudsman in Hydro One to ensure transparency and accountability. But, Mr. Speaker, no government in recent memory has expanded the oversight of independent legislative officers as this government has done. We created a position of financial accountability officer. We made the French Language Services Commissioner independent. We put into place the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. We've allocated Answer. new powers to the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, expanded the Ombudsman's role to include oversight of municipalities, school boards, and public funded universities. Thank you. Final supplementary. <laughs> that was actually Ontario calling to ask when the truth would be heard from over there. <laughs> Minister, Hydro One customers and we are in the opposition want decisive action today on the Ombudsman's investigation. Only Liberals would think that an insincere apology was proportional response to over 10,000 complaints and businesses being overcharged millions of dollars. But after this morning's vote, the officers of the legislature will no longer be able to hold Hydro One or you accountable. Although you may think you're helping yourself by politically by removing this oversight, in reality, without these checks, you will become more arrogant, more reckless, and which will lead to even greater scandals in the future. Minister, will you not save yourself from your party's own hubris and allow the Auditor General and the Ombudsman to continue to investigate Hydro One or for the last chance remove any reference to it at all from the budget bill? Thank you. Minister. Minister Speaker, as Minister, I received the report from the Ombudsman uh, and I referred it to the new chair of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, uh, with a request that it be uh, reviewed. Uh, to ensure that all recommendations will be implemented, Mr. Speaker, to look at any further issues around the billing issue and customer service issues, to report back publicly, Mr. Speaker, uh, within 40 days. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at the same time, the new chair of Hydro One uh, is uh, in the process of selecting a CEO of Hydro One, uh, and myself as minister and the chair of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, are in the process of restructuring the board of Hydro One. Mr. Speaker, we're moving forward with determination. The member from Renfrew and Nipissing, Pembroke, the second uh, warning. No, sorry, you're warned. <laughs> Wrap up sentence, please. Mr. Speaker, we're moving forward responsibly with re determination to reposition an asset which will be invested in infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, billions of dollars of infrastructure Thank you. which will not require tax increases or new Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier stood in her place, looked me in the, looked me in the eye, and said regarding the sell-off of Hydro One that, quote, it was very clear in our budget, in our platform, and in our budget again that we were looking at assets, unquote. Well, Speaker, going to Niagara Falls and standing in front of the Sir Adam Beck Dam is looking at a hydro asset. <laughs> looking isn't selling, Speaker. Recycling isn't selling, Speaker. Maximizing isn't selling. Unlocking isn't selling. Will this Premier cut the nonsense and the doublespeak and give Ontarians a chance to have their say by holding a referendum on Hydro One sell-off? Before I turn to the Premier, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask the, the leader to withdraw. Withdrawn, Speaker. Thank you. Premier. Well, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we, we, I've, and I've read these quotes a number of times, and I will, uh, I'll read them again. But, Mr. Speaker, one in particular, uh, the uh, the 2014 budget, and the quote um, that I will read is that we will look at maximizing and unlocking value from assets it currently holds, including real estate holdings as well as crown corporations such as OPG, Hydro One, and the LCO. Member from Hamilton. And actually, those words, Mr. Speaker, can encompass a variety of things. That's why those words were used, Mr. Speaker, because. Because at the time of the budget, the decision had not been made as to exactly what we were going to be doing. The, that's why we had asked Ed Clark and his group to look at the assets, Mr. Speaker. And by that, I mean, and you know, you can have a narrow definition, the denotation of look, but Mr. Speaker, the connotation of look is that we would review, that we would, that we would Answer. analyze, and that we would then make a decision, and there would be a range of things that we would be considering, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Speaker, yesterday the Premier lectured Ontarians about how she'd been clear about her plan to maximize assets. Ontarians heard about recycling, unlocking, leveraging, but not a sell-off. People shouldn't need Google Translate together with a magic eight-ball speaker to figure out what this Premier is talking about. The Premier went out of her way to keep Ontarians in the dark about her scheme to sell off Hydro One. That's the fact, Speaker. Ontarians actually want to be heard, Speaker. In a democracy, that is not an extraordinary request when we're dealing with one of the biggest policy decisions to come our way in a generation. Will this Premier Question. do the right thing by the people of Ontario and hold a referendum on the sell-off of Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, well, what I would say to the leader of the third party is she just cannot have it both ways. She cannot read, as everyone did, uh, our, our uh, page 257 of our budget, where we said we're exploring options to unlock the full value of a wide range of valuable provincial assets, specifically the LCBO, Hydro One and OPG, unquote. She can't read that and then go out and say on July 9, 2014, and I quote, the leader of the third party. The, ND, the budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I do not believe that the leader of the third party was the only person in Ontario who understood Answer. that one of the things we were looking at in that range of options was the potential sale of some of those assets, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please? Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Become very accustomed to the wily ways of this government and the way they talk. The Premier did not run on selling Hydro One. End of story, Speaker. If she doesn't believe that. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Please finish. If she doesn't believe that, Speaker, then she needs to go out to the Tim Hortons in Hamilton, the Tim Hortons in Windsor, in Sarnia, in Ottawa, in Thunder Bay, or in fact, when she's in the Tim Hortons today in Toronto, I encourage her to ask anyone she meets, do they remember that this Premier was running on a plan to sell off Hydro One? Do they remember at all voting to sell off Hydro One? I've been in those communities, and I can tell you I've been hearing from people at town hall meetings across Ontario, not a single person voted to sell off Hydro One in the province of Ontario. Will she do the right thing and put this to a referendum? Thank you. You see it, please. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, if the leader of the third party were as emphatic in her support for transit and transportation infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, I think she would understand why it is so important that we find a way to make those investments. And we were very clear that making those investments was a fundamental part of our economic plan, Mr. Speaker. Finish, Mr. Speaker, government after government in this province and in 
jurisdictions around North America have put off the investment in infrastructure, which is why those same jurisdictions are looking now to find ways to make those investments, because that neglect has set in, Mr. Speaker. We are not going to wait any longer. We have been building since 2003, and we are going to, con uh, we're going to continue building. But we cannot do that by only borrowing, which is what the leader of the third party would have us do. We were very clear that there are a range of things we need to do. One of them was reviewing assets and unlocking value. Time. and using Answer. that to invest in future assets. Yeah. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. New question. Leader of the third party. Middle-class families deserve a fair shake, Speaker. They deserve a hydro system that they can afford. They deserve a hydro system that support jo supports jobs and that actually serves the public interest. But instead of fixing Hydro One, Speaker, this Premier is handing control to big banks, to offshore investors, and to a small group of her powerful friends instead. Stop the clock. The, uh, the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and uh, Infrastructure is warned. Please finish. A say, Speaker. Speaker, they deserve a say. Will this Premier put those families ahead of a handful of insiders and give people a say by holding a referendum? Speaker, I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to comment on the specifics of this, but Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I know that the people of Ontario know that Hydro One is valuable. That's why, Mr. Speaker, the protections that we have put in place are there. We've made it very clear that 40% of the of this company will remain in the public hands, Mr. Speaker. The protections for regulation of uh, price controls, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Energy Board, which sets prices now, will set prices after this arrangement is in place, Mr. Speaker. We've also made it clear that no single entity or individual will own more than 10 percent. There are controls over the board, Mr. Speaker, that will remain in the hands of the provincial government. Those are the protections that must be in place. This was a difficult decision, but, Mr. Speaker, it is the right decision because if we do not do this, Answer. we cannot make the investments in transit and transportation infrastructure that apparently the third party doesn't think are important, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Earth to Premier, nobody believes any of that about the 40 per cent, about the 10 per cent. Nobody believes any of that, Speaker. Earth to Premier. Hydro One is the backbone of our economy. It's what gets electricity to homes and to businesses. People deserve to know that Hydro One is being run in their best interest, Speaker. Instead, Hydro One is going to be run to benefit banks, offshore investors, and a small group of the Premier's powerful friends. Giving people their say is the right thing to do in this circumstance, Speaker. Can the Premier tell middle-class families why she's more interested in hearing from a small group Member of from powerful Newmark, insiders Aurora. than she is in hearing from Ontarians themselves about a sell-off of their Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Be seated, please. Thank you. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, over the last uh, eight or nine years, this government has invested uh, over $33 billion to make a system clean reliable, Mr. Speaker, and affordable. We put ourselves into a surplus position when we had a deficit previously. What we've done with that surplus, Mr. Speaker, is create the Industrial Electricity Incentive Program, a program that gives up to 50 per cent off marginal increase in electricity use to businesses. That includes, for the Braying member from Tim and St. James, Mr. Speaker, uh, two new gold mines opening in Northern Ontario using the IEI program, Mr. Speaker. Last year, Detour Gold opening up uh, a new gold mine, Mr. Falls, Speaker, saving $20 million a particular yeah. year. Mr. Speaker, creating jobs in Pembroke at MDF Paperboard, 140 new jobs. In Whitby, Mr. Speaker, Atlantic Packaging, creating 80 jobs with Answer. this program that's based on surplus energy that we have invested in, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, people deserve to know that when the Premier says something, she actually means it. They deserve to know that when the Premier stands up 
in this legislature and says, and I quote, we are not selling off the assets, that the Premier is being honest. It turns out that the Premier is selling Hydro One, Speaker. People deserve a Premier who listens to them and who treats them with respect. Will this Premier agree to hold a Hydro One referendum, or will she keep telling families in Ontario that she really doesn't care at all what they think? You see her, please? You see her, please? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I think many people in the province of Ontario, certainly everybody on this side of the House, believe that the Premier that we have has got courage to make tough decisions, Mr. Speaker, moving forward. Mr. Speaker, she recognizes. She recognizes there's an infrastructure deficit across Canada, including in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And she has put together a 10-year, $34 billion program, Mr. Speaker, to invest in schools and hospitals and transit, Mr. Speaker. The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Finish, please. It's visionary, Mr. Speaker. It takes a lot of guts to make that type of commitment, Mr. Speaker. It's going to make Ontario more competitive, and it's going to increase our quality of life in this province, Mr. Speaker. So I'm pleased to be on this side of the House, Answer. where we're doing progress rather than being totally negative. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. A member from Dufferin Calvin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Members may not be aware that the Attorney General has decided to pay the legal fees of former Justice of the Peace Santino Spadafora to the tune of $14,000. Spadafora retired days before he was scheduled to appear before the Justices of the Peace Review Council to face a disciplinary hearing for submitting false expenses. There were allegations of 600 false claims for meals, hotels, highway tolls, mileage in the amount of $16,000. By retiring, the Review Council lost jurisdiction over Spadafori because he's not a justice anymore, and he avoids the disciplinary hearing. Just so I'm clear, there was no hearing. Minister, can you explain what justification you used Question. to pay Spadafori's legal fees? General. So the, uh, first of all, thank you for the question, and the member is right. Yes, I've made the decision to, uh, to pay uh, the recommendation of the Justice of the Peace Review Council. And as you know, oh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, Justice of the Peace yes. Review Council has been in place since uh, the uh, 1970s, and it's an, independent, it's an independent body that has uh, uh, a mandate to receive and investigate complaints. Uh, against uh, justice of the peace and review and approve standard of conduct and also moreover they have the uh, the legislative responsibility to make recommendation to government about compensation for costs associated with uh, with hearing and uh, yes the uh, the uh, justice of the peace has uh, uh, resigned uh, before uh, the hearing, so there was no hearing, and I'll explain in the supplementary Thank why you. I came to this conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was a recommendation. You're the minister. You actually get to make the decision. A reasonable person would have to believe that the only reason Spadafore chose to retire early was to avoid the hearing. If the hearing had found him guilty of submitting false claims, he could have been forced to repay that $16,000. Instead, you want to give him another $14,000. Looks to me like Spadafore gamed the system to avoid a disciplinary hearing and to avoid repaying the false expense claims. Do the right thing, Minister. Make the decision today that you will not pay his here, legal here. fees. Thank you. I, uh, I want to remind all members that once you are warned, the next time I speak to you, you are named. Attorney General. 
Speaker, uh, yes, if uh, the member uh, on the opposite would have taken the time to read, which is public, uh, the, uh, the recommendation and the reasoning from the Justice of the Peace Review Council, uh, they will, she will have uh, seen that, uh, you know, uh, the, the member from Dufferin Caledon come to order second time. Different reason, like the, the retired before the finding was made, and the council uh, noted that in the Canadian system of justice, it is not appropriate to assume that there will have been a finding of judicial misconduct. And the work of the Justice of the Peace the lawyer, uh, to narrow the issue ultimately saved considerable cost. And uh, after uh, consider uh, and that none of the work. The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Carry on. To say, Monsieur, Spe Monsieur Speaker, that none of the work after he submitted his letter of retirement was Sir. compensated to uh, ensure that the process was not being manipulated. So, yes, after consideration, uh, I have decided to follow the review council Thank consideration. You. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. The Liberals are stacking the Ontario Energy Board full of energy insiders and people who have made their careers fighting for higher rates. Marika Hare spent 15 years with Enbridge before she joined the OEB. Then, while at the OEB, she approved a 40 per cent rate increase for her old employer. Wow. Now, now she's getting a promotion to vice chair. Wow. The Premier is also appointing former energy lobbyists and a former Hydro One staff whose job it was to get higher rates. Wow. The Premier is stacking the OEB with energy insiders. The Premier is putting a lot of faith in the OEB, so why is she appointing and promoting energy insiders Question. instead of consumer advocates who will stick up for families and businesses? Good Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I don't believe that that member really believes the premise of his question. I know, Mr. Speaker, that he understands when you put together a board of directors of 12 or 14 people, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure he knows, Mr. Speaker, that when you put together a board of 12 or 14 people, you get a selection of expertises on that particular board. You want somebody who can chair an audit committee, Mr. Speaker. You want somebody who has experience in the sector, who's an industrial or business experience person. You need somebody who can uh, understand human resources, Mr. Speaker. You get a, a, comp a composite of people on the board, Mr. Speaker. And so we do not apologize for having people on the Ontario Energy sir. Board who understand the sector, Mr. Speaker, and who can contribute to a board of directors with that level of expertise. Supplementary. Speaker, it's not just that the Premier is stacking the OEB with energy industry insiders. The government is also looking at cutting supports for customer interveners who help consumers fight for fair energy rates. This is an awfully strange time for the Premier to be mucking around with the inner workings of the OEB. At the same time, as she's engaging in the biggest hydro sell-off since Mike Harris and Ernie Eves. Why? At the same time as the Premier is appointing and promoting energy insiders to the OEB and selling off Hydro One to the private sector, why is the Premier looking at stopping interveners from standing up for consumers at the Ontario Energy Board? Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, the current chair uh, and CEO of uh, the Ontario Energy Board, Rosemary Leclerc, Mr. Speaker, uh, is an industry insider. She was formerly the CEO of Hydro Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. Hydro Ottawa comes to this particular board, Mr. Speaker, looking for rate increases. I haven't heard one person suggest that that background experience puts her in a conflict of interest, Mr. Speaker. We have credible people on the board. They come from a cross-section of expertise in, in, in the community, Mr. Speaker, sometimes from outside the province, sometimes from outside the country, Mr. Speaker, because we want objective people on that board. We want people who understand the industry, who understand consumer advocacy, who understand audits 
markets, Mr. Speaker, and who understand communications, Mr. Speaker. We have all of that on the Ontario Energy Board, and we make no excuse for that. Thank you. New question. The member from Ottawa South. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Trans Canada submitted a project description for the proposed Energy East Pipeline project to the National Energy Board. And I know that Ontarians have voiced their concerns about this proposal, including some of my own constituents in Ottawa South. South. Concerns around uh, risks, potential risks to public safety, our lakes and rivers, our natural gas supply. Recent federal legislation has limited the scope and time allotted for the National Energy Board hearings and can limit community and public participation in the regulatory process. To that end, I understand many Ontarians are interested in knowing what role the province will have in the regulatory process. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House what role Ontario will play in the hearing process and what the government is doing to ensure that the voices of Ontarians are heard? Question. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from Ottawa South for the question. Our government believes that it is vital that the National Energy Board only move forward once it adheres to our Cabinet-approved principles, namely the highest safety and environmental standards be met, the duty to fully consult with Aboriginal and local communities must be met, there must be world-leading contingency planning and emergency response programs together with the developer assuming 100 per cent liability for spills, Mr. Speaker. They must demonstrate economic benefits and opportunities to the people of Ontario over the short and long term, and current consumers of natural gas must be protected with regards to price and supply. The OEB has engaged with stakeholders, First Nations and Métis communities and the public, and will complete a report that represents the interests of all Ontarians. Yes, this report will inform Ontario's position at the National Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for that answer. And I know that my constituents who attended the uh, community, uh, OEB community consultation session appreciate it very much. I attended the consultation myself, and I can state that these were not only a forum for Ontarians to provide their input, but also to learn more about the proposed project itself. Mr. Speaker, Ontario has been proactive in its approach to Energy East, asking the OEP to undertake a review of the application, which is ongoing, and forming a working group with the province of Quebec to identify common interests position, and positions concerning this project. Minister, since TransCanada has filed this application to the National Energy Board, I believe that it has effectively suspended the application and is amending it to reflect significant changes to the proposal as it was originally filed. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is this yet to Our be team. seen amended proposal affecting Ontario's ability to review the application and prepare its intervention with the National Thank Energy you. Board? Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, uh, it is vital that all governments take the time to hear from experts, community and municipal leaders, Aboriginal groups, business leaders and other impacted groups. Just today, Mr. Speaker, I and the Quebec Energy Minister sent a joint letter to the National Energy Board seeking clarification on a number of areas of shared concern, given that TransCanada is significantly amending its application. Elements of the process have become unclear, Mr. Speaker. We expect and deserve to know exactly what those projects will include and to have the applications supported by the highest degree of rigour, analysis and due diligence. We will not compromise the health and safety of Ontarians. We look forward to a timely response from the National Energy Board and will actively participate yes, in the federal regulatory process once it formally commences. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton, Court of Lake Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, as of June 1st, the assistive devices program is now facing a $20 million cut in funding. Oh my. These cuts were made without any consultation with the industry and with no consideration of the vulnerable individuals that rely on assistive devices yep. like walkers and wheelchairs. According to the Canadian Assistive Devices Association, Ontarians in need of these products will suffer due to these actions on the part of the assistive device program. The t this 20 million reduction is yet another example of your government cutting corners, like cutting funding for the diabetes test strips, chiropractic care, physiotherapy, and, and cataract surgeries. This is going to have long-term consequences for seniors. Mm -hmm. So, Minister, Question. will you immediately reinstate the program so assistive device dealers across Ontario can continue to provide the necessary services for vulnerable Thank people? You. <laughs> Minister, 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. I'm proud of the fact that this province and this government is providing, through the Assistive Devices Program, support to more than 300,000 Ontarians. Wow. And we've done that by, uh, in fact, that's an increase of uh, 100,000 people since when we came into office in 2003. The funding that we've provided to Assistive Devices in that program since 2003 has actually increased by 99 wow. percent, Mr. Speaker, where we're providing almost half a billion dollars to Ontarians. Ontarians and those Ontarians that deserve the support and need the support. Uh, but I think the member would uh, agree and acknowledge that as technologies evolve, efficiencies are find, uh, found. Rather, Mr. Speaker, we've learned that for some devices we've been overpaying as that technology has, has evolved. We've also found opportunities where, uh, by doing a request for proposals or uh, looking at providing them in a more efficient way, that we can also find savings. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we both know that there'll be more need as the age of seniors uh, increases. There's more seniors in our province, so the reduction for the funding for the assistive device program will result in further costs to our health care system. I get these concerns in my community office every day. It's yet another example of your government spending a dollar to save a dime. This means cuts that uh, a grandmother would have to wait three months for funding for a wheelchair or pay out of her own pocket instead of receiving the wheelchair when she needs it. Instead, she's more likely to fall, end up back in the hospital, further costing the system and impacting the quality of her life. Minister, did you consider the impact that these cuts have on the quality of health care and the long-term implications to our Question. seniors? Thank you. Minister? Well, well, Mr. Speaker, we've certainly considered the impact of our changes in continuing to review the more than 8,000 uh, products that we provide through this program mm -hmm. to Ontarians. We've seen and we understand the improved access that they're going to provide, and in many cases, it's going to lower the cost to the consumer, to Ontarians, as we continue to review precisely how much we're paying for each one of these items. Mm -hmm. But we will continue to review the approved costing of the funding products. I think it's a responsible thing for a government to do to not overpay for certain devices, to, to pay the uh, appropriate amount uh, for them. And these changes, as I mentioned, in many cases result, will actually result in lower costs for Ontarians. So this uh, it speaks again to the importance of we'll have an opportunity in a few minutes to make sure the budget passes so we can actually, yes, actually implement these changes, these efficiencies and improvements, so we can provide even more Thank services you. to Ontarians. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Speaker. No question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, on Monday, the Minister of Education claimed that class size caps were not on the table. Yesterday, though, the Minister admitted that class size caps are part of negotiations, blaming the President of the School Boards Association. Ontarians know that the Premier and her government hold ultimate responsibility over education in this province. The blame game won't work. The Premier and her government need to stand up for families and commit to keeping class size manageable, ensuring high-quality education for our kids. Small class sizes are essential to student learning. Kids don't need less one-on-one -on -one time. They need more. Absolutely. Will the Premier step up and commit to families that there will be no increase to class size caps in the fall? Yes or no? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. And of course, uh, the responsibility of the government, which is clear from the legislation, is as the funder. So what I can absolutely say is that the funding will be for 22 to 1 at secondary, which is what we're talking about. The funding was 22 to 1 last year. The funding's 22 to 1 this year. The funding's been 22 to 1 for the last decade. Order. The funding was probably 22 to 1 for the decade before that, except during the social contract when it was a totally different uh, system anyway. So if you're asking me, am I committed to that to which I can commit? It, which is, is the funding going to carry on at 22 to 1? Absolutely. Answer. That's what's in the grants. That's what in the money that's been sent to the boards. That is the money Thank that you. they're basing their budgets on. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I think my, my question was pretty straightforward. Will the minister do her job and protect education or not? Speaker, the Premier must tell the minister to step up and stop any changes that would increase class size caps. 
The minister needs to stop sitting on the sidelines and protect our kids' education in this province. The blame game is growing old, and Ontarians see right through it. One-on-one -on -one time is absolutely crucial to kids' success in school, and frankly, the Premier and her government are well aware of that. Kids with special needs, kids with ESL requirements, kids across the province will pay the price for overcrowded classrooms. Speaker, will the Premier guarantee to all of us in this House that she will not allow any increases to current class size caps? Minister. Yes, and I, I'm not sure how many times I can say this. My responsibility is for the funding. The funding last year was $22.5 million. The funding this year is $22.5 billion. Sorry. Last year, $22.5 billion. This time, $22.5 billion. The number of students has actually decreased. Because the number of students in the system is decreasing, when you hold the funding co constant, that means that the amount of funding per pupil is actually going up. Now, does every board get exactly the same funding? Of course not. We have boards where the enrollment has gone down 25%. Answer. We have other boards where the enrollment's gone up 10, 20, 30%. Of course, the funding shifts around as the students go down in one board Thank and you. another. The total funding. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is to the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. Ending child poverty was a goal of writer and activist the late June Colwood. The Keep the Promise campaign was established two years ago by Friends of June to give children a chance to voice their experiences, aspirations, and commitment to ending child poverty. They've created videos, practical resources for kids and teachers in 25 projects across Canada and a website called keepthepromise.ca, which includes a very rich collection of print and video resources. Ms. Colwood, who came to be known as Canada's Conscience, once said, if any of you happens to see an injustice, you are no longer a spectator, you are a participant. I believe that statement holds true today and should Question. always guide the work of our government. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform this House what kind of progress our government is making to reduce child poverty? Thank you. Minister responsible for poverty reduction strategy. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener Centre for the question and also for quoting my personal hero, June Colwood. I commend the Keep the Promise campaign for their work to engage children and their communities in the fight against child poverty. Our government shares their commitment to ensuring that kids get the very best start in life. Well, there is certainly much more to do, Speaker. We have made significant strides since introducing our first poverty reduction strategy in 2008. And I know the member from Hamilton Stony Creek will be very happy to know that at last count, 47,000 children and their families have been lifted out of poverty, and tens of thousands more have been prevented from falling into poverty. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, made last progress time. on each of the eight indi indicators, including school readiness, standard of living, and birth weight. Speaker. Under our new Answer. poverty reduction strategy, we're recommitting to reducing our, our child poverty by 25 per cent because our children are worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for her answer. It's very encouraging to learn that we are making progress when it comes to dealing with the issue of child poverty. Yesterday, the Keep the Promise campaign hosted June Colwood Children's Day, featuring a colloquium in which students presented their campaign work to end child poverty in Canada, and they talked to elected representatives, leaders, and Keep the Promise volunteers on the priorities that lie ahead. Students in grades 5 to 8 were involved in a conference highlighting current issues, opportunities, and profiling a child's perspective on poverty, which no doubt was an incredible experience for everyone involved. Minister, it's inspiring to hear that our government has reaffirmed our commitment to reduce child poverty by 25 per cent, and we know that you and your team have been working very hard to achieve this goal. Minister, uh, can, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please outline some of the other ways in which our government is tackling this very important issue? 
Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, uh, I'm very pleased to report that we're taking a number of concrete steps that uh, will reduce child poverty beginning in July. The Ontario Child Benefit maximum and income threshold are both being increased, indexed to inflation, Speaker, raising the maximum benefit to $1,336 per child, more than double what it was in 2008, and of course it did not exist before we introduced it. Speaker, We've increased the number of student nutrition programs, providing healthy meals to an additional, an additional 31,000 children and youth. We've expanded eligibility for Healthy Smiles Ontario. That means 70,000 more kids have access to the dental care that they need. We're also committed going forward, Speaker, to extending health benefits such as prescription Answer. drugs, vision care, assistive devices, and mental health services to children in low-income families. Thank you. No question. The Labour Management is well opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, Minister, uh, one month ago, uh, I asked you why my constituent, Mr. Jim Lees, has to wait months for a bed in a long-term care facility. I explained that he has gone back and forth uh, between a hospital and the local retirement home because the home cannot provide the care he needs as they are not a long-term care facility. Not to mention that the family is paying thousands more each month than they would for nursing home care. Well, Minister, it's been a month since I asked you that question, and yet the situ situation remains exactly the same. Still no beds. Mr. Lees is still in the same retirement home, and he's still not receiving the care he needs. In fact, uh, Mr. Lees fell last week and spent a couple of days in hospital because he was over-medicated. Minister, I will ask you the same question I asked you one month ago. Question. Will you help Mr. Lees, or is this yet another example of the health care seniors can expect under your government? Minister of Health, long term care. To the Associate Minister of Health. Associate Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the uh, member for his advocacy on behalf of his, patient, of his uh, constituent. And I want to begin by uh, reminding the member that, as he well knows, my office and his office has been working very hard on this case. The CCAC has been working with the family uh, to make sure that the best possible care is made available to the resident. And as he well knows, having been a past Minister of Health, I cannot comment on the particulars of this case. But what I can say, what I can say is that any Ontarian who needs urgent care is placed on the highest priority list for our long-term care homes and is provided that level of priority care. What I can also remind the member is that this government has made historic investments in long-term care. In fact, we just uh, the member in Susan yes, Murray just reopened a new long-term care with 50 new beds over there. So we are continuing to invest, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure the member that we will Thank continue you. to do everything we can. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, back to the uh, Minister of Health. Since I raised this issue, Mr. Lees has been offered six idle beds. These are beds that were not on the list of the 12 nursing homes his family has selected. And remember, the family is only required to select three homes, and they've selected 12. One of those beds was in Toronto. One was way up north. Two were not suitable for Mr. Care, Mr. Lee's uh, care needs. And the others remain a, a mystery to all of us, as the family was not told where these beds were located. And I say to the minister, I'm not sure how you expect a family to give, agree to a nursing home bed that even your own ministry can't identify where it is. Minister, I find it troubling that this man is classified as critical, the highest priority, and you, you can't find him a long-term care bed. I don't believe you just opened 50 Question. beds. We opened 20,000 new beds in our eight years. You haven't built a gosh darn thing in your 12 years. Don't you think we need Thank some you. new nursing home beds in this province? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to again thank the member for his question, remind him that I can't speak to the specifics of this case. Happy to speak to him outside. Also know that my office has been working very diligently with his office and that the CCAC has been working very diligently with the family to resolve the issue. But what I can say is that this government has been making significant investments in long-term care. In fact, we've driven down wait times by 34%. And get this, Mr. Speaker, you know, we have driven down wait times by 34%, but when the Conservatives were 
were in power, they did not even they did not even measure wait times, Mr. Speaker. So I'm taking no lessons from the member opposite on this issue. All I can say is we continue to invest in long-term care, and we have we are going to be redeveloping 30,000 new beds over the next little while. That's a historic investment in long-term care. Thank you. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, you will know of Little John Enterprises in Timmins. It's a second-generation sawmill that's been operating in our community for a number of years. They have come to you, they have gone to your ministry at the, in the field in order to be able to get an allocation of timber. All they need is 8,000 cubic meters of wood of popular so that they can continue supplying a niche market that they've created that is being supplied out of the mill in Timmins. I've gone to you, they've gone to you, we've asked you for more wood, and you've written back to us and saying uh, that they're, and essentially most of the resource has been allocated. Well, Mr. Speaker, my question to the minister is this. If you say that most of the wood has been reallocated, why is it that we're shipping 71,000 cubic meters of popular annually into the province of Quebec and not supplying mills here in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I want to thank the member for the question. As he's, uh, as he's aware, we have had a fair bit of back and forth on this particular issue. In fact, I think it was before Christmas that he first raised it with me or shortly after I came into the ministry. Uh, I asked him to supply me with a note at that time going back to July or August or September of last year. I never did at that time receive uh, a note from the member on it, so I never heard back from him. So I'm not sure how important it was to him. Subsequent to that, Speaker, the member came to me uh, a little while ago. He raised the issue of this particular operation and enterprise in his riding that he is concerned about. I asked him at that time to supply me with some information, which he did somewhere like four, five, or six months after the initial conversation that we'd had on a particular topic. Speaker, I finally did get the information specifically from the member. We have responded to the member uh, through a letter, I believe. Answer. In fact, I believe I've asked my staff to contact his staff directly to let him know the circumstances. So, Speaker, we're aware of the issue, finally, uh, Thank from you. the member. With well, Speaker, I'll get more in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, that was, uh, that was the lows of lows that I've seen in a long time. The Minister, I say this. We know that 71,000 cubic metres of wood of poplar is being shipped out of Ontario, unprocessed, shipped into the province of Quebec. At the same time, we have mills in Ontario Russell. that need that wood. So my question to you is simply this. Why should it be such a difficult thing to make an 8,000 cubic meter allocation to Little John Enterprises when we know we've got 71,000 cubic meters of poplar being moved out of the province, out of Ontario, and into the province of Quebec? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. I I think the issue of wood flows into Quebec are relevant, and in fact, for quite some time now, I've asked my staff uh, to get back to me with issues related to that and how it works, and there may be a point in the not-too-distant future where we make some recommendations on that. I would say wood has flowed into Quebec for decades. This is not new, and in fact, a number of people in Ontario receive employment directly as a result of those wood flows. Speaker, but more specifically to the issue uh, at the heart of the member's questions, many smaller enterprises across the province have always uh, managed to find their wood allocation that's needed to support their operation through business-to-business -business relationships. As I understand it, the history on this particular enterprise is exactly that. We have been supporting the efforts of the enterprise with the district m &R staff through, them, uh, through that uh, operation to get some support for them to try and effect uh, a resolution. I'm not sure why they haven't been able to resolve it. It could be price. I'm not sure, Speaker. Thank you. But that's obviously something that we don't have directly. Thank you. New question. The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. As the minister knows, our government must continue to improve accessibility. In fact, in my riding, Speaker, the Learning Disabilities Association of Halton has done a great job of helping to meet the educational, social and employment needs of young people and adults with learning disabilities. Currently, one in seven Ontarians have a disability. That number is expected to grow in the coming years. Looking at employment, 55% of Canadians with disabilities believe that hiding their disability increases their chances of getting hired and promoted. Today, the minister announced our government's Accessibility Action Plan. 
Would the minister please inform the House about our government's path forward to create an accessible province? Question. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as we reach the halfway point of the AODA's implementation, we have an opportunity to reflect and celebrate on the incredible progress we've made, at the same time recalibrate on the path forward to our goal of building an accessible Ontario by 2025. If we continue to lead the country, and we are, Mr. Speaker, if we remain an, an international leader, and we are, Mr. Speaker, we need to drive a cultural shift across society to improve accessibility. This morning, I had the privilege of announcing a series of new initiatives to reinvigorate the momentum that's needed to reach our goals of, uh, of to be fully accessible by 2025. Mr. Speaker, we're going to work with employers to try to get there. Included in our initiatives are a couple of new seed Answer. capacity funds, including a community loans program and a partnership accessible employment fund. Mr. Speaker, we're going Thank to you. get to where we need to go, and we're going to reinvigorate momentum in this. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for the great job that he is doing and for that answer, and of course for working so diligently on this very important file. Now, improving accessibility is not just the right thing to do for our society, but it's also the smart thing to do for our economy. That's why organizations like Community Living North Halton which is really a group that is working very hard and diligently day in and day out. They work with community partners to offer support and services for people living with disability, and they're so important. We cannot afford to let any Ontarians fall through the cracks, Mr. Speaker. As I understand it, Provost Moran has completed her legislature review of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Question. Act. This review was meant to be a guide. Would the minister please inform the House on how Provost Moran's legislative review is Thank helping you. to guide our path forward? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the second area of focus of our action plan involves adopting key recommendations of Provost Moran's recent review of the AODA. As recommended by Provost Moran, we're working closely with stakeholders to improve the legislation, including ensuring that the timing between reviews makes sense and that duplication between the two pieces of legislation are also addressed in a number of different ways. We also can uh, recognize that compliance really isn't where it needs to be, so we continue, need to continue to do work on the enforcement side. So we're going to be implementa implementing audit blitzes where challenges present. We're going to be enhancing the effectiveness of our, of our enforcement programs. For 2025, our goal is 1,200 audits. Mr. Speaker, on the other hand, we know that businesses that champion accessibility yes, have to be recognized as well. We're going to be putting in place a series of initiatives to do just that to celebrate successes as we work the right the government house leader on a point of work thank you speaker uh, speaker we had many partners who joined us today on an important announcement dealing with uh, reform of police the records check in ontario please welcome uh, jacqueline tasca and michelle keys from the john Howard society of ontario and Camille Quinville and Upala Chandra Sakera uh, from the Canadian Mental Health Association Ontario Division and other friends who joined us for the announcement. Thank you. Thank you. Member from Oxford on a point of work. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the East Gallery today are Shelley Rattleband, uh, who works in my Woodstock constituency office, and her two daughters, Chelsea and Brittany. They're all here from the Great Riding of Oxford, and I'm pleased to welcome them to Queen's Park, and I hope they have a great day here. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 91, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various acts. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
members, please take your seats. Wavering. On June 2nd, 2015, Mr. Souza moved third reading of Bill 91. All those in favor, please so rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Bavell. Mr. Bavell. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasso. Mr. Balkasso. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Donnerlo. Mr. Donnerlo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dawn. Mr. Dawn. Mr. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mr. Koala. Mr. Koala. Mr. Dan Malone. Mr. Dan Malone. Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley. Mr. McGarry. Mr. McGarry. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Milcher. Mr. Milcher. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Neal. Mr. Neal. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the court. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Banton. Mr. Banton. Mr. Nova. Mr. Nova. Mr. Tabbs. Mr. Tabbs. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishev. Mr. Nadishev. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Angelino. Mr. Angelino. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Montag. Mr. Montag. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Seven and the nays being 46, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, please do not serve, close the door. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. As is the convention, no one interrupts a vote, but I am standing to say that I am reminding all members that pictures are forbidden in this place. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.